Yes, good morning. Welcome to day two of the conference on fossil fuel supply and climate policy. It's really a pleasure. Um, a lot of full conversations uh, continuing from yesterday and this morning. I'm very pleased to kick us off today with a fantastic panel, plenary panel, um, led by Jesse Burton from the University of Cape Town, who will be moderating. Um, welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here this morning and welcome for this amazing panel on breaking carbon lock-in in developing countries. We have a very esteemed panel and we're going to address some of the key drivers, especially the political, social and economic, that support the ongoing use of fossil fuels in, in, in developing countries, especially coal. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start with some of the key global areas, looking at financial institutions and their approaches to just transition before moving on to policy approaches for a just transition and then case studies from developing countries, um, as well as diplomatic lessons and experiences. So without further ado, I'm gonna start with um, Isabel Blanco. Um, Isabel is an Associate Director and the Lead Environmental Economist of the Economics, Governance and Policy Group of the EBRD. Um, she holds a PhD in economics and offers more than 20 years of experience in the fields of climate change and sustainable infrastructure. And she'll be speaking on the Multilateral Development Bank's common approach to a just transition. So um, lovely to be back after the, the COVID uh, gap. And I was just chatting with some colleagues. I was here on this plenary session, I think uh, even this, at the same time on the second day, four years ago, so in, 20, in 2018. And so many things have changed since I was speaking last time about a slightly different but related topic. What I'm going to say today, or the topic of, of my presentation, is um, multilateral development banks common approach uh, to a just transition. So what do we mean by that? What do we do? And how do we collaborate uh, with others? Just transition as, as a concept um, started many years ago, but I think for the multilaterals, the starting point was the Katowice COP uh, in 2018, precisely, in, in Poland. And um, four years ago, the landscape was very different from what it is today. So in 2018, we had very low energy prices, and there was still fresh in the memory of, of many countries and multilaterals as well, the crisis of the 24, of 2014. So in 2014, the fossil fuel prices had a very um, a record low, and this had a huge impact in the fiscal um, in the fiscal balance of some of the fossil fuel exporters, including some European countries, by the way, which saw that some of their assets uh, in Europe uh, had the risk of, of being stranded. So it was probably the right time for a discussion on just transition. What do we mean? And uh, some uh, leading international bodies like the European Commission, they came up with, for example, the just transition mechanism, which is a financial package for coal uh, communities in Europe and neighboring countries. Now, fast forward, and we are in 2022, and what I see this summer is a big increase in uh, energy consumption worldwide after the, the COVID crisis. I see supply imbalances triggered by the Ukrainian crisis, but also by, by other events like uh, nuclear power outages in, uh, in France, for example, and record fossil fuel and energy prices. So fossil fuel companies and the power companies have posted record profits in the first half of 2022. And uh, talking about just transition in these circumstances is a bit more challenging. Um, or maybe we need to change a bit what we mean by, by just transition. And this is something that I wanted to tell you before we start the conversation. The just transition as a concept may be farther away today than it was four years ago for all these elements I'm telling you about. Now, getting to the, to the topic of my presentation, which is you know, a joint declaration by multilaterals about promoting just transition, and you will think, what a dull topic. How could they disagree? Well, actually, it took us ages to agree on a text that was mutually um, uh, convincing or that was acceptable to everybody. And this is because multilaterals, we come from very different geographic spaces. We have a diver not just diverging, but different mandates, and we come from um, varied backgrounds. So. I work in EBRD, which is a London-based uh, institution. So for the, uh, for the EBRD and for the EIB, 
when we speak about just transition, this is mainly about coal communities. And what do we do with, what do we do with uh, mono industries um, uh, that are uh, facing assets that are losing value very rapidly, either by economics themselves or by policy. Now, you go to the African Development Bank or the Latin American Development Bank, and when they speak about just transition, what they mean is, how does this affect or how do we protect the people who are being affected by, uh, by climate change and probably haven't done anything to, to deserve this? Um, for some other multilaterals that have a lot of oil uh, exporter countries, uh, the discussion or just transition means, what are you going to give me if you want me to stop pumping uh, oil uh, out of the ground? Because gas is green, right? So that's their uh, starting point. And on Sunday, I was preparing these notes and I was talking to my husband and, uh, and I said about just transition and he said, this is about lower energy bills, right? So all this to say that uh, the concept of just transition that we are using in this conference, in reality, I don't think it's set in stone. And, um, and this is the second point I wanted to make uh, today for, for this presentation. Now, without further ado, and very quickly, as I said, um, we started discussing about just transition. The multilaterals started about just transition just before the pandemic, so a couple of years ago, in this very different environment I told you. The declaration was made in the COP26, less than a year ago in, in Glasgow. Uh, we agreed on the approach, some of the principles that I will tell you about, the peer learning and some partnerships. So we agreed on collaborating with each other on this topic. Our next uh, milestone is the COP27, uh, where we are asked to come with concrete and practical steps or what is it that we are going to do about just transition. I said some of the, this, uh, the varying interpretations of a just transition and all the many activities that multilaterals uh, are doing that can support a just transition. I'm going to put a few examples uh, later so that you see what kind of projects and what kind of policy guidance we give when we speak about this. These are the principles very long, uh, a bit wordy, uh, but every word was discussed, negotiated, and agreed. So there is nothing that is missing and nothing that can be put on top of that. I'm risking my life here by making a, a summary of, of what they mean. So the first one simply says that uh, just transition is about both climate and social economic outcomes, and both need to go together. The second one is that the focus is on moving away from greenhouse gas emissions intensive activities. And remember what I told you about the African and American Development Bank thinking it was about climate resilience. The third one is about MDBs uh, encouraging just transition through some of their existing activities. So it was there, there was not a new to restart all the, all the work there, rather to collect and to complement and to improve activities that all of us were doing in the space without specifically calling it just transition. The fourth uh, principle reinforces that just transition seeks to mitigate the negative social economic impacts, supporting affected workers and communities. And again, see the emphasis on workers and communities, particularly workers. And finally, this one is about governance. And this is the recognition that many transitions have happened before and sometimes the solutions come top down. Um, and this is a recognition from MDBs that for a just transition to work, it needs to take into account and have a fair, transparent and participatory process in which the stakeholders are involved. Now, in practical terms, what are MDBs doing to support a just transition? This is a bit dated. Um, a slide actually which we used in the COP26 and some more things have been happening this year although as you know the focus these days is all about uh, securing some uh, energy supply and helping uh, communities pay their en energy bills but anyway uh, some examples of projects that we do that can be called just transition we have been doing a lot of um, mine repurposing so mines that are being closed they are repurposed for other uh, uses and um, Photovoltaic is a very common use because the infrastructure is there and it's a place that normally suits well for, um, for solar photovoltaic. Another thing we've been doing is helping regions and countries plan and think about their just transition uh, programs and processes. So planning and uh, diagnostic studies that convert into plans. 
Another thing that we have been doing is training in green jobs, upskilling and reskilling affected workers on those communities. We have been providing finance which is tied to the closure of some stranded assets or near to be stranded assets, in particular coal, including some conditions on staff reallocation and reskilling of affected people and communities. And finally, we have been doing a lot of economic diversification activities in mono industry regions, trying to widen the range of activities that could be done there. Our next step is the COP27 uh, in a couple of months' time, where we are going to collect the progress that has been made by each of us and come with concrete proposals for collaboration. And I think I've exhausted my time, so thank you for your attention and very happy to, to take questions later. Thanks. Thank you very much. And you were actually ahead of time, so we've caught up a minute. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Gaylor montmesson Claire. Um, Gaylor is a senior economist at Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, which is an economic policy research institute based in Pretoria, South Africa. Um, he leads TIPS's work on just transition and sustainability, um, and he'll be talking about a policy toolbox that he and some colleagues have developed for just transitions in the Global South. Thanks so much, uh, Jesse, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to, to be here today. And, and I guess I'll, I'll be talking really about the balancing act that we're trying to perform when we're working about just transition to be ambitious uh, and, and transformative and radical, but at the same time being practical about it and, and how we go. Um, I guess as a, as a way of context, there's a few things you know, to, to remember is that the first thing is we really need to get the transition going, you know, and I feel like sometimes in the just transition spheres, we forget that the transition actually is not really underway, um, you know, uh, and, and that shouldn't overshadow what we do around just transition. The global south faces the burden of, of climate impacts and, you know, we can't talk about just transition if we don't have a climate compatible pathway. That's the first kind of bare minimum uh, to, to, to think about. The, the second thing is to acknowledge that uh, the need for one global just transition aids another, and we must really acknowledge that from a global south perspective, that you know, historical responsibilities actually matter of the countries that created the problem, but also, uh, of course, uh, the, the wealthy in every single country. And, and I think that's something that, again, from a, from a global perspective, we must internalize in the, in the thinking um and that we do uh, at a global level uh, there's no national just transition without a, a global uh, just transition in terms of then moving moving forward it's really important to, uh, to acknowledge that a just transition is not an add-on it's not just we're doing a transition and we're trying to make it just it is effectively a paradigm shift um and you know that obviously creates a lot of complexity in terms of how we you know uh, implement that going forward, but it is the reality on, on the ground. Um, we have to acknowledge the past and the present. You know, um, the current situation is uh, neither just nor sustainable. And that's, again, something I feel like in a just transition discussion we forget. Uh, often I feel like we're talking about maintaining a level of existing justice. Uh, in the global south, the situation, the starting point is generally unjust. So we're actually trying to reverse that pattern. And I think that creates the scale of the challenge. Um, of course, no transition has even been just. So it's not like we have a blueprint to do that. And that makes it even uh, more complicated. Uh, we need to acknowledge uh, that the current economic system is not sustainable economically, socially or environmentally. Uh, and that the current trajectory of our transition, even though it is very slow and not really moving, is very pro-rich. It's pro-rich countries, pro-rich corporations, and pro-rich households. The rest is being left behind. It's already behind anyway, and it's being left behind in the transition. Um, so again, putting a bit of emphasis on the scale of the challenge. The basis of the just transition, certainly from our perspective, is that people, co companies, communities, countries have a different ability to adjust to disruption. Uh, and, and to respond to it. You know, we can't avoid the disruption. It's how we respond to that. Um, and 
certainly the idea behind just transition for us is that vulnerable stakeholders should not be negatively impacted by the transition and ideally they should actually be better off and, and that's recognizing that the starting point is unjust you know uh, and, and i think that puts the foundation of a, of a new paradigm of development the way we understand just transition uh, is, is through three key fundamental ideas one is procedural justice it's a very simple idea that says there's no just outcome without a just process. It must be bottom up, it must be inclusive, it can't just be decided in the center of power, be it economic or political. Uh, the second is distributive justice. You know, we need to deal with the impact. That's what people tend to reduce to uh, just transition. You know, well, someone's gonna lose their job, it's gonna lose their livelihood, what are we gonna do about it? It's extremely important, but it's only one component of the just transition, of course, uh, and then who's gonna pay for that. We add a third fundamental dimension to that, uh, which is restorative justice. What it says is that we need to right historical wrong. It's a, it's a pivotal opportunity, it's a unique opportunity in time to actually address some of the long-standing inequalities and, and problems that we face in the Global South uh, and that you know, we can address through, uh, through address transition effectively. Uh, having said that, we have to acknowledge that uh, it is economy-wide and society-wide, so it's not about coal, it's not about fossil fuel. Of course, coal and fossil fuels are at the center of that, they're the hotspots but we see it as very much an economy-wide and society-wide transformation. Um, we start with coal, everybody talks about it, but it is broader than that. You know, what about transport? What about agriculture? What about tourism? What about other manufacturing, other mining, and so forth? Um, we also acknowledge that it's only truly effective uh, if it's going to be transformative uh, and, and really trying to encompass those three dimensions of justice and, and do that in a fairly, fairly radical way. Um, of course, there's different understanding of just transition. Not everybody, you know, as an agreement, I think it was already shared that, you know, everybody's got a slightly different version of it. Um, importantly, there's also a lot of people who actually have visions of just transition that are incompatible with just transition. Uh, you know, we have had to contend with greenwashing for a long time. Now we have to deal with just transition washing. Uh, and and it's, it's quite hard to, to, to have to really uh, uh, tackle that. Um, but even within the spectrum of people who actually believe in a just transition, you know, you have different levels of ambition. Uh, and, and I think that's quite important to, to acknowledge as, as well. Um, that's just a, a little summary of, of what that means in terms of, I guess, the, the least ambitious versions try to really deal with the consequences of the problems, whereas the more ambitious ones, of course, look at the roots of the problems and not just the consequences. So just a, a little summary of, of that. Um, but if we try to be quite practical about it uh you know now i've said the kind of ambitious part of it and and, and very practically um we try to map some of the tools to do that and uh, when it comes to participatory justice uh, it's really about making the process as inclusive as possible so it's not just saying well we've consulted or we're going to consult but it's really about empowering people and giving them the opportunity to meaningfully contribute uh, in terms of having access to to of course the financial means to do that but more importantly I think the skills and the knowledge uh, and their ability to bring the evidence forward for themselves is really critical um, there's a lot of examples of of processes that are bottom up that are trying to do that the difficulty is they're not always connected to what's happening top down and, and of course you know then how do you connect the bottom up initiatives to actual decision making processes is is critical lots of uh, really great experiences uh, that i can speak about in in the in the q a as well uh, later on but we're really trying to to build a process that's going to bring some trust uh, and and empower people rather than just tick a box if we think about distributive justice, there's three set of key policies that we can harness. Uh, the first one that everybody kind of talks about is, is so-called labor market policies. Uh, in a nutshell, it's uh, kind of retraining and reskilling, and that's what people think about. Uh, you know, we're going to train people to get new jobs. Um, definitely necessary, but vastly, vastly insufficient. Tends to only work in an environment where you have high job creation, which sadly is not the environment which most global South countries actually operate. Um, so you need to do it, but if you think that's going to solve the problems, you're really, really misled. Um, there's 
of course, other uh, labor market policies that are uh, employed, both on the active and passive side, and they, they're quite important, particularly to have minimum uh, labor standards and, and working conditions and to raise the bar, um, but they're not uh, sufficient in providing the solution. Um, we, we see it quite uh, critically that we have to complement that with industrial policy um, to set the economy of the future effectively uh, and, and to transform the function of the economy. And that's through uh, having an impact on ownership patterns, of course, but also the market institutions and, and infrastructure. Um, but industrial policy can also be used to influence existing sectors so that they can um, be more inclusive and more sustainable. Uh, and that's through finance, through trade, through, through skills and so forth. But acknowledging that it's not just about workers um, and it's about the whole society, then social protection becomes really critical uh, going forward. Um, and there's a lot of mechanisms. Um, contributory social protection tends to be linked to employment, but non-contributory social protection particularly through um, social transfers uh, and public employment programs, uh, but also the recognition of social care uh, are uh, key, uh, key avenues to do that and to expand the benefits and the ambition of just transition beyond just firms and workers to society, society as a whole. Uh, if I uh, look at the, the last area, uh, certainly not the least, restorative justice, it has three key components. Um, <clears throat> one is socioeconomic empowerment. So it speaks to issues around access to modern housing and modern services like energy, water, but also transport, um, but also access to, to new technologies. And, and by access, it doesn't mean everyone is to own the technology, but they must benefit from it. And I think that's quite clear when we talk about solar power, you know, spot like a culture, electric vehicles, and so forth. Um, and then more broadly, of course, access to economic opportunity, primarily land in, in, in a global South uh, country uh, is fundamental. Um, the second aspect is social cultural restoration. And in a nutshell, is really around non predatory use of land, particularly around mining, but certainly around any kind of big project. Uh, and, and that speaks to uh, respect for local cultures, but also access to health and education and a lot of other things. Um, lastly, of course, environmental restoration in terms of land, air, water, but also carbon is quite critical and, and the center of, of any uh, action. So as I conclude, um, really what I was talking about is the Grant Balancing Act when we're talking about policy. We're trying to maintain this transformative ambition very radical thinking and action, but also charting practical ways towards implementation. It's not easy, uh, but certainly, you know, through building blocks, uh, we can we can try and achieve that going forward. Uh, it's all about wielding political will as well as the vested interest from all parties. That's through gaining power. I think we've been talking about it yesterday already. Uh, and as we gain more power to will the political will and vested interest into action, then uh, hopefully we can move towards our just transition going forward. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Gaylor, um, for that very insightful uh, set of options, I suppose, menu, portfolio, orchestra. We use a lot of words to describe it in South Africa. Um, our next speaker is Claudia Strambo. Um, Claudia is a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute, where she leads the Tackling Carbon Lock-In Initiative. Her re research interests include the politics of energy transitions, the political economy of extractive industries and just transitions. Um, and she'll be looking at the geopolitics of carbon lock-in in fossil fuel de dependent developing countries, looking at Colombia and Nigeria. Welcome. Thanks, Jesse, and hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good you made it that early. So today I'm presenting ongoing research we are doing with colleagues at Adelphi and the Stockholm Environment Institute on geopolitics and carbon lock-in. And this research is part of a program on um, called Mistra Geopolitics, which uh, aims at critically exploring the interaction between geopolitics, security, and climate and environmental change. And I, our aim is to understand better how these courses contribute to legitimize uh, and challenge actions and decisions that support further fossil fuel development and reinforce carbon lock-in in developing countries. Uh, just a heads up and managing expectation here, we're not uh, taking a classical approach to geopolitics, we're taking a critical one. 
So we're looking at how spatial agendas from the national governments, in these two case studies, draw on environmental concerns and objectives to justify their actions and inactions. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, so in terms of methods, our focus here is on oil and gas, and we choose Colombia and Nigeria because of their high dependence on uh, this uh, fossil fuel for balancing their national accounts and their important role it plays in development policy historically. They also have both uh, national oil and gas companies and a history of domestic conflict, but there are also differences, for instance, in terms of the international organizations they belong to or the structure of their economy. And we worked with national policy documents, speeches by high-level uh, officials, and quotes in newspapers for the periods between 2015 and May 2022, so just before Petro Petro's election. Uh, and we coded them using a list of categories related to energy, climate, development, and geopolitics. And I will focus now in the presentation on narratives, but we also work with other aspects of the, the discourse. And you see that many of the elements uh, I'm going to talk about, we discussed them yesterday for companies. So in Colombia, oil and gas production uh, has remained central to um, the world period we look at. And before, um, of course, uh, Santos Duque government vision um, really placed it at the core of country's futures. Um, the plans were to increase fossil production. Uh, and exports through offshore production and conventional resources and improved recovery rates. And uh, one key narrative is that oil and gas extraction is necessary for energy autonomy and sovereignty. But interesting, interestingly, there is very little elaboration on that. It's very naturalized, like we need it because of our security, but that's it, we keep it there. Another narrative is about their role for development uh, and peace under Santos, especially. Uh, through the revenues they generate and an expression that comes back uh, often is taking advantage of the underground wealth to address ground poverty as if ground poverty was not related in an outcome of extracting this underground wealth um, <laughs> the more detailed narrative actually that emerged during this period is about gas as an essential component of the energy transition um, through substituting other fuels in transport uh, industry in the residential sector and thus reducing emissions relatively, uh, improving access to clean energy, generating the revenue necessary for the energy transition. And gas is presented as a bridge technology, but without explaining how and when we get from one side of the bridge to the other side of the bridge, which is quite typical from this narrative. But the narrative also recognizes that there are changes in global policy and uh, markets that requires adjustments in how oil and gas are being produced. So there's a lot about decarbonizing the oil and gas sector through energy efficiency, tackling fugitive emissions, uh, on-site renewable energy development, uh, CCUS, of course, and carbon offsetting, which will save us all. Um, another um, aspect is making the sector, and especially Ecopetrol, the national oil company, a key contributor to reforestation and renewable energy development, and also use fossil fuel to produce and export blue hydrogen, which would contribute to address transition risk by substituting decreasing revenues from coal exports. As uh, most of you know, probably co uh, coal is one of the main exports of Colombia. Also. And according to this narrative, um, uh, this strategy, together with um, a lot of efforts in renewable energy development and energy efficiency improvement, is, is positioning Colombia as a regional leader in the energy transition. And I realize I forgot to change the slide. <laughs> um, now, as for G Nigeria, um, here too, producing gas is uh, presented as the pillar of the country's energy and economic future. Gas production, is used, um, gas production and use is seen as a solution for the country's objective of increasing energy security by diversifying the energy mix and improving energy access with health co benefits and meeting climate mitigation targets by substituting some uh, of the oil domestically, especially in the mobility sector. But the stronger and more detailed narrative is regarding its role for economic diversification and industrialization. For instance, with petrochemicals, we had a, um, a presentation about that yesterday. And in turn, petrochemicals would enable uh, the expansion and the growth of the agriculture sector. So there is this like chain effect. And the, ambi the ambition altogether is to make Nigeria the African hub for gas-based industries and a future pioneer, pioneer on global markets through technologies powered by gas. 
So gas as a transition fuel is also present here with an emphasis on richer countries needing to respect Nigeria's own pace in the move to renewables. And overall, gas is clearly prioritized over renewables. And finally, gas is presented, yes, I know it's sad. <laughs> finally, gas is presented as a way to increase regional influence through cross-country cross -country pipelines and improve the country's position in the global economic system by enabling a more complex economy. And as for oil, the narrative is much less developed, and it's the same in Colombia. There are mentions of the need to diversify revenues and a vision to become a major exporter of refined products, but oil, is, uh, oil production is very much naturalized. There isn't uh, much about arguing for its continuity. It's a given. So some key insight from the analysis so far is that the framings of gas futures fit with how the countries position themselves internationally. So Colombia has been positioning itself as a leader of the SDG and climate agendas globally. It's also a member of the OECD since 2020, so there are expectations um, as to um, the, the, the pace and direction of the energy transition that come with that. And then we see the narrative emphasizing the, the role of gas for the energy transition. And in Nigeria, which uh, presents itself and sees itself as an important oil and gas player and a regional power, and also is a member of OPEC since a few, more than 50 years. The emphasis is on shifting uh, from being uh, an oil to a gas nation and the importance of gas for indu industrialization. And also both narratives sustain uh, the domestic and global status quo. There is no change in distribution of power neither domestically or globally, a little bit with Nigeria seeking to have better terms of trade, uh, but under the same rules of the game. Then the next point is about um, the discourses that surround these narratives, or these narratives belong to, point to developed countries' decision and actions or inactions to legitimize their own visions for the sector. So Colombia talks a lot about Canada as being both and at the same time uh, in a compatible and balanced way a leader of conservation and climate um, mitigation, but also a leader in, um, and Sita Pori, you're laughing, a leader in, <laughs> in mining and uh, hydrocarbons, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, Nigeria talks about how lucky uh, we are that um, the EU taxonomy takes gas as a clean fuel. Right. Um, so oil and gas narratives are strategically also um, quite unclear about the links between domestic and international transition. So I think your points about there is no just transition domestically without a just transition globally here is uh, interesting to put it in context. Um, they mix up different sorts of fossil fuels and importantly, they completely ignore and sometimes even undermine the harms that oil and gas production imposes uh, on local communities. Um, so what does that mean in terms of tackling carbon lock-in? Um, we need to keep pointing to oil and gas narratives inconsistencies. Um, as Tsepo has said yesterday, repeat, 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 right? Um, so gas as a low carbon fuel, and here I'll mention the Colombia long-term strategy that says this strategy does not contemplate the disappearance of fossil fuel nor gas in the energy mix. So fossil fuel uh, does no longer include gas in the, the long-term strategy of Colombia. Um, stranded assets and responsible macroeconomic management, of course, also um, work on, on, on this narrative and, and uh, uh, renewable energy versus gas for energy access. But it's not enough. Uh, and it's not enough because as Gaylor put it, it very well, um, the issue fundamentally is about much more than energy. Um, the quote by Nigeria's uh, Minister of Petroleum here shows that the main objective is not delivering energy for development fast, but finding ways to take advantage of gas in a post-Paris Agreement setting. And underlying this is the political role of fossil fuel through the revenues they produce and the political influence into which these revenues translate. Renewable energy does not produce the same levels of rents. So the Colombia and Nigeria cases highlight that alternative energy narratives are not sufficient, that we need alternative development narratives, and that these help shift power uh, redistributed both domestically and globally. And when designing these narratives, we need to remember 
um, as uh, put by Hemvil, that these are um, to be successful. These need uh, not only to be coherent, but they also need to address audiences' main concerns in accordance with their core beliefs. So we really need more work, like the one Kara Pike uh, present yesterday afternoon uh, on it identifying um, these audiences, our audiences' main concerns and core beliefs to design uh, narratives of, of transformation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Claudia, for that very interesting insight into the alternative development pathways that countries depend on for fossil fuels in contrast to this kind of transformative approach that Just Transition might offer. Um, so moving on to another very interesting um, in a fossil fuel, mostly coal exporter, um, Dr. Radicha Wiranagara um, from the Institute for, <laughs> excuse me, the Institute for Essential Services Reform. Um, Radich is a senior researcher at IESR, which is an energy and environmental think tank based in Indonesia. He's responsible for conducting research on the energy tr transition in Indonesia towards 100% renewables. Um, part of this includes looking at decarbonization of the country's thermal power plants. Um, and he's going to be presenting a fascinating framework to assess the implications of an accelerated and just coal power phase out in support of Indonesia's 2050 net zero emissions target. Thanks, Radich. Hello. <clears throat> Thanks, Jesse, for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, share our latest uh, work, which is in collaboration with the uh, Center for Global Sustainability of the University of Maryland, US. And as Jesse has mentioned before, yeah, it will be about a framework that uh, has been developed to assess uh, <clears throat> the financing needs and the impact of a just and accelerated uh, coal phase out specifically in Indonesia. So before going into further uh, on the methodology and the outcome, I'd like to just put in some context first on Indonesia's position in its uh, net zero target. So in the last COP uh, in Glasgow, I think the our Minister, the Ministry of Energy of Mineral Resources, have endorsed uh, three out of four clauses, and whilst agreeing on uh, considering a accelerated coal phase out by 2040s, and this is conditional upon receiving the uh, additional uh, support from the uh, international community in terms of financial and technical assistance, and. It has. I have to admit, it is a big, a huge task because as uh, we uh, um, the coal-fired power plants account to about 65 percent of the generation mix in Indonesia, and that translates into a quarter of the country's total CO2 emissions. And apart from the uh, the one in the COP26 event, uh, the government has actually proposed a plan. This is led by the state-owned uh, utility company, PLN, uh, and it includes a plan to phase out uh, its uh, coal uh, fleet by 2056 with uh, no new coal-fired power plants beyond uh, 2023. And of course, this comes with some exceptions, and these exceptions include those projects who are already, uh, which are already under construction and or have reached their financial close with the financier of the, of the project. And in order to accelerate this coal uh, phase out uh, in Indonesia and to meet with the 1.5 degrees Celsius compatible pathway, I think it's reasonable to have this additional support to, you know, to minimize the socioeconomic impacts that is coming from the uh, stranded assets and the job losses and also the investment that needs to be uh, put in into scaling up the renewables to meet the growing demand and also to be replacing the coal fire pl power plants that are being phased out. And we are also uh, considering a number of financing mechanisms, including one that has already been going in South Africa, the, the JETP, and also the one that's being launched last year in the, in the, in the COP event, uh, which is the ADB's uh, energy transition mechanism. Uh, right now, the ADB's uh, energy transition mechanism is in the phase of uh, developing a CESA, a socio-economic, uh, uh, I forgot the, 
the long term for that, but uh, it's still in the early phase of uh, implementation of uh, uh, the mechanism. So, yeah, just a little bit of update uh, in this uh, uh, code phase out dynamics. So, uh, Indonesia just recently produced a presidential regulation. This is on the mandate to accelerate the development of renewables in the electricity sector. And the regulation also acknowledges, of course, the need to retire these uh, coal-fired power plants earlier. Uh, and given the situation that you know, we have 65% of the generation come from coal, it is reasonable to phase out the coal-fired power plants as soon as possible so that the renewables can come in uh, into the system uh, uh, and meet the demand that is needed. And the details on the uh, coal-fired power plants uh, accelerate uh, phase-out is covered in Article 3, and this includes a instruction to the MEMR, the, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, to develop a roadmap for an accelerated coal phase-out, and this needs to be coordinated among other ministries, including the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of State-Owned Enterprises, because we are talking about phasing out coal-fired power plants that is, uh, some of them are owned by the state-owned utility company. And yeah, most of them are owned by the IPP, the Ind Independent Power Producers. And also on, 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 on the article, there's also a paragraph on banning the new coal-fired power plants. Again, this comes with some exceptions. Uh, especially those power plants that are contributing to the value added, uh, uh, the economy, uh, the economy of the uh, the national economy, and also uh, the the article also includes the limitation of the operation of these all coal fire plants, and that would be until 2050. And also there there are also criteria on the technical and economic uh, uh, part that is. Uh, on, for the assessment of units that needs to be phased out. And I'd like to also mention that IESR also been uh, asked by the MEMR to work along with, with them and the PLN to develop this roadmap. And this will be uh, uh, in the form of a ministerial decree. And we are currently working on it. And this will be, hopefully this can be showcased later on, uh, on the G20 event in November and in Bali, Indonesia. And yeah, moving on to the framework that has been developed. So in the framework, we have three steps. So the first one is we develop this uh, national net zero uh, pathways. And to develop this uh, pathway, we use this uh, global integrated assessment model developed by uh, University of Maryland. Yeah, it's called the GCAM, Global Change Analysis Model. And uh, the pathway that has been developed in that step will be fit in, in was feeding into the next step, which is on the, uh, the development of detailed plan by plan retirement. And we'll use a multi criteria scoring system for this uh, exercise. And, and the last step that we did in this framework is to uh, quantify the, uh, the benefit and cost from implementing a just and rapid uh, coal to clean energy transition. A little bit about the coal-fired power plant fleet characteristic in Indonesia. So um, as you can see from the graph there, um, yeah, so it's even the graph here, we can see the, uh, the development of the coal-fired power plant that has been started since the, nine, the 80s, uh, late 80s. So, and, but then uh, it grows up quite significantly after uh, uh, Mid, uh, mid 90s, and that has been uh, uh, m uh, forced by the need to uh, to meet the the, the demand uh, of uh, uh, of the countries. And uh, most of these um, power plants, if you can see from the graph here, are owned by an I IPP, so independent power producers. And and yeah, then the next one is owned by PLN, uh, which is the state-owned uh, utility company. And we also have some captive plants which are used for their own uh, needs. So like in a smelter, uh, smeltering uh, of, of, of mining and for some industrial activities uh, in, in some part of the country. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, IPP has uh, 
most of the new, larger, and more efficient plants, and as uh, shown previously. And this is just more on the breakdown of that. So uh, in this analysis, uh, in this framework, we focus uh, more on the power plants that is owned by uh, PLN and, and IPP. So we exclude the, one, the, the captive plants. So in total, there are about uh, 40.3 gigawatts in, in capacity and about 72 plants. And this is just a further details on the methodology that we use in, in, this, in, in this framework. So uh, yeah, I will try to speed up. <laughs> <laughs> OK, two minutes, right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, I'll skip this, and we can discuss this further later uh, after the event. And, this is the just to show you the, the the pathway that has been developed through the model. So we have a by 2050 expected that we have uh, most of the generation comes from the solar PV, with uh, some minuscule proportion of the uh, coal uh, abated coal uh, fire power plants and and biomass. And the fee, uh, the graph on the right here just to show you that if we follow the trajectory of the uh, coal fire power plants that are currently in the planning, in the pre permit, permitted construction and operating, it will go beyond 2050. So uh, we need to focus on more on this uh, blue solid line, which is going to be uh, the one that is uh, compatible with the 1.5 degree pathway. So in this, uh, if we're following this line, then the the the, the coal uh, will be all completely phased out by 2045. And yeah, this is just on the multi criteria scoring that we use to rank the, uh, the priority of the phase out of uh, the units that are uh, operating and in, and in constructions or in the PPA uh, stages. And we only consider these three uh, uh, criteria, um, it's uh, technical attributes and profitability and environmental impact, but we left out the grid stability and equity because we don't really have that much data at the time to do the, uh, uh, the scoring, uh, scoring for those uh, criteria. And we use a normalized uh, rank scoring and we uh, average them to be a, in a single a combined metric and then we uh, ended up with this uh, graph where we see that most of the power plants that are in the uh, lower end of the uh, of the graph is considered to be having a worse performance both in the technicality and the profitability and the environmental impacts so as you can see that most of them are uh, power plants with uh, capacity lower than 300 megawatts and with uh, technology of uh, Super critical uh, uh, cycle uh, technology, uh, steam cycle technology. And in this framework, we also identify the low hanging fruit plants. So uh, these are uh, power plants that we consider uh, that needs to be retired quickly in the near term between 2022 and 2023. And of course, um, if we show this to the government, they will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll smile and then <laughs> say that it, I think it's too early to. Uh, to do that because we are in the 2022 and next year will be 2023 and the government are not quite ready to 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 do so so but anyway we, we will still showing in that that this uh, power plants are needs to be phased out because we 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 know that and from the result that they have poor technical economic and environmental performance and yeah this is just uh, a further uh, elaboration of the uh, uh, of the outcome from combining the pathway and the, the ranking system that we had before so by uh, 20 uh, between 2022 and 2023 we have about 9.2 gigawatts and then the largest uh, capacity being phased out it will be hap will happen in 2031 and 2040 and the rest uh, happen in in the five last five year period between 2045 and 2045 and since indonesia is an archipelago country so we have uh, a separate power system and the those this systems are still not interconnected so uh, this is just to show how the phasing out uh, uh, speed uh, in each of the system and these are showing a similar retirement speed across different system 
So by 2040s and yeah, 2045, yeah, there will be phased out. And yeah, this is the framework that we use to assess the cost and benefit analysis. And from that, we see that the uh, the the benefit actually uh, outpaces the, uh, the 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 cost that is. We quantify that two to four times larger than the cost that is going to be incurred if we uh, consider an accelerated phase out of the coal fire power plants. And this is just a breakdown of the costs that would be uh, mostly going to cover the cost that's going to be uh, on the retirement of the IPP plants, about two thirds of it. And yeah, this is on the, uh, the stranded asset costs that will be uh, uh, there by the uh, finance needs. And this is the investments that is going to be needed for the renewables investment. So in total will be up until 2050, there will be about 1.2 trillion uh, US dollar needed to replace this coal fire plant and to meet the, <laughs> uh, the electricity demand. I know this is a huge number and that's why <laughs> a, we require the financial support in doing so. <laughs> So these are the key findings that I think I've covered before and policy recommendations. Some of it are already being uh, implemented by the government with the uh, produce, uh, production of this uh, presidential regulation, which is a positive development so far. And for the future research, uh, we will improve some of data and metric qualification, quantification because as I mentioned before, there are um, information that are not available at the time of the study, and we will try to improve that and include in our future research. And uh, the, second, uh, the second thing that I think need to be uh, done in the future research is on the uh, assessment of the power systems, uh, because in the, in the study that we've done before, we only do it in a, a national level, an aggregate, and we need to do it down into the, each power system and how that affect the quality. Yeah, that's that for me. Sorry for taking much of the time. Yeah, yeah. I hope I can get this presentation. Thank you. That's su it was super interesting. I'm sorry I have to cut you off. I'm, I work with modelers, so I want to look at all the detail. Um, but I think we can come back to some of those interesting questions around power system and, and other issues in the in the Q and A. Um, so last but not least, um, we've got Elias Spickerman. Um, Elias is a policy officer within the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action in Germany, where he works on different topics around international climate action and energy transition. Um, and he will be speaking today, he'll be sharing lessons learned and experiences from his daily work on, on carbon lock-in and, and, and energy system work in the, in the ministry. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with so many experts. Um, I cannot share, as you yes, said, any uh, research results, but I can share the experiences that we're having uh, in our daily work. Um, as you all know, uh, carbon lock-ins are not exclusive to developing and emerging countries, um, uh, and uh, lock-ins in developing and emerging countries are often connected to the activities in industrialized countries and their banks and companies. Therefore, I would like to start with looking at the current German policies. Um, you are all aware of the energy crisis, uh, as other countries, Germany is facing uh, very um, high challenges when it comes to energy security and uh, connected prices. And therefore, uh, there are some uh, a whole set of measures taken. Um, some of those measures are, from my perspective, or I would argue, future-proofed. Um, however, uh, Germany is still um, in some of uh, yeah, carbon pathways, are locked in in carbon pathways. So some of the measures are uh, for sure based on fossil fuel technologies. Uh, most prominently, uh, you probably heard about um, the aim of reducing the Russian gas imports in Germany and replacing those imports, uh, or re first by reducing the demand and, and second by replacing those imports with pipeline gas and LNG gas from other countries. Uh, Germany doesn't have any LNG terminals yet, so there are currently terminals in construction. And um, Germany is trying to reduce the danger of uh, lock-ins in those new infrastructure by um, 
A, uh, looking for uh, installing floating units, um, and B, um, looking that those new infrastructure is convertible for the use of green hydrogen uh, later on. However, uh, given that the uh, additional gas demand from Germany um, is creating uh, investments uh, in other countries and producing countries, and given that the EU uh, is drastically or will drastically reduce um, the gas demand in the next 20 years, there might be uh, dangers of carbon lock-ins in um, those producing countries that are now building up capacities. Another measure that you probably heard is uh, on coal. So there is a policy to reactivate um, coal power plants. Um, this is a short-term measure for one and a half years. Um, and the idea is to reduce the gas demand in the power sector um, by using additional coal. Uh, however, this policy is not interfering with the aim of ideally phasing out coal power in Germany by 2030. And um, due to the cap of the ETS in, in the EU, um, additional emissions will be limited. Overall, uh, and this is maybe another message than Christoph sent yesterday, overall I hope, or we are hoping very much that uh, the repower measures and the national measures that we're taking currently are boosting the energy transition uh, and will reduce emissions in the medium to longer term. Uh, I would shortly like to stick to the example of Germany um, and coal. Um, you are probably aware of the coal phase out in Germany. Um, and this is maybe one example of breaking carbon lock-ins. Um, and it comes with a quite, or quite a few lessons learned. I would just like to mention three of them. Um, just a short recap. So there is a compensation for lignite power plants operators. There is a um, tendering mechanism for hard coal power plants to get them out of the market. And there is uh, quite a few... Um, but a big sum for, of finance uh, to support structural changes in the coal regions that are affected in Germany. Uh, and in total, uh, it's around 40 gigawatts that will be closed. Um, to the first point, uh, the measures that I just mentioned um, are quite pricey. Um, at least the price tag is quite high. So in Germany, we will spend until 2038 around 45 billion euros. Um, to break this carbon lock-in. Um, and talking to uh, developing uh, countries and their governments, um, they start laughing at us um, and saying, okay, this is not a possible option for us. Uh, and it's super expensive. And that's why I would like to underline that this is a political price and it's not reflecting the cost that is needed to breaking um, the, the lock-in. Uh, it's in the end much cheaper, I guess. And... Uh, Tapora, you said yesterday we need to repeat, repeat, and repeat. Um, you said it as well. Uh, it's a good message. Um, so sorry for the no-brainer. Uh, Germany, and this is the second point, uh, has been subsidizing coal production for decades. Um, so uh, it's key uh, to um, look at fossil fuel subsidies and introduce carbon price so you're reflecting the true costs of the production. And the second no-brainer, um, is uh, you have to start early to tackle carbon lock-ins. Um, it's just cheaper and much easier. Uh, so carbon lock-ins are not only, as you know, about economic issues. It's also about uh, social um, lock-ins and um, cultural and political ones. So uh, this makes it pretty difficult, and uh, it's important to, to start early to address those issues. Uh, leaving the German example, I would like to broaden the perspective and just share some experiences from our everyday work um, in the international um, sphere in our ministry. Um, three on uh, industrialized countries and their potentials to avoid uh, or break carbon lock-ins or help uh, breaking carbon lock-ins in developing and uh, emerging countries. Three with respect to developing countries and two overarching if I'm in time. Um, so, when it comes to industrialized countries, um, first point I wanted to mention is that when Germany um, found the national consensus to phase out uh, coal power, um, we were in a position internationally to address the topic and to discuss and promote the topic um, internationally via energy partnerships, 
um, uh, bilateral programs uh, or initiatives such as the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. And I guess it's uh, very important, as the same for the BOGA, um, to kind of expand the global discussion and uh, to introduce like a new normal. Um, I guess uh, talking about coal with uh, many countries five years ago was very difficult, and now it's uh, we are late, but now it's normal, and it's, uh, this is something we have to achieve also in other topics. Second is um, private finance. Uh, yesterday I was uh, in the Leave it in the Crown session, um, and there uh, was a list of German banks showed uh, that are engaging in those uh, um, carbon bomb projects. Um, so financial markets are becoming more carbon sensitive. Uh, however, this is going very slowly, and I guess uh, industrialized countries need to support this uh, process also by regulatory aspects. And this is, I guess, a homework which is not yet done among industrialized countries. Um, on public finance, this is the third point, we are doing our homework at the moment in Germany. Um, we are a supporter of the COP26 statement. It has also been mentioned yesterday uh, on phasing out public finance, uh, international public finance for fossil fuels. Uh, we're currently um, revising our instruments um, and uh, align them with the climate targets. And we are very much aware that this policy um, is somehow uh, difficult to communicate uh, when we are at the same time uh, going into LNG terminals and LNG infrastructure. And therefore, and this brings me to um, the points on developing, development, uh, developing countries, um, it's key uh, to work together with developing and emerging countries to find solutions and alternatives uh, to avoid carbon lock-ins and break carbon lock-ins. Um, the chat piece have been mentioned. I guess this is a very recent example. However, there are many more. And I guess we also have to think about additional partnership forms um, to accelerate um, the developments. And uh, as you all know, the potentials for renewables um, in developing countries are uh, quite significant. So there's not only a chance to uh, creating access, but also to create local industries and value chains. Second point, what is needed to make those decisions? Um, and I guess among others, it's knowledge and awareness. Um, we see again and again that availability and access to knowledge and data is key and is like the enabler for um, climate action at all levels. Um, so therefore, we appreciate the launch of the fossil fuel registry as uh, one very positive example. But I think there are still huge knowledge gaps that we have to address, uh, for example, when it comes to uh, consequences of higher temperature on national economies. So I guess there's additional room for action. And third, um, I guess data and awareness is not enough. So we need to work on people-focused narratives. And Claudia made also uh, already the point um, that I wanted to make, so I jump over this. Um, but I guess narratives are much needed to address uh, the social and cultural dimensions and also political dimensions of um, the carbon lock-ins. The two overarching points, and then I'm done. Uh, yesterday we heard about BOGA and PPCA. Um, and I think or I'm convinced that those initiatives, international initiatives and regionals, can be very supportive in helping to avoid carbon lock-ins and breaking carbon lock-ins. Um, however, we need to put quality over quantity. There's a recent EU study, I guess from the last year, counting 450 climate initiatives uh, in the last 10 years that have been launched. And uh, from our everyday experiences, uh, even for a well-equipped government like Germany, it's not possible to cope with those uh, numbers of initiatives. So we need to think about how to streamline the international collaboration and how to find solutions to this issue. And the last point, um, globally, energy savings and energy efficiency uh, must be uh, at the forefront and must be boosted. Um, there's a huge potential which is currently not um, uh, tapped. Um, and reducing the energy demand uh, by those measures is, I guess, a very important way uh, to address carbon lock-ins uh, from the demand side. Thanks.
Thanks all. I don't know who has the floofy box. <laughs> Um, thank you. So we've heard about the challenges of what it means to get agreement on just transition, how these processes of implementation can be challenging. There's amazing options and menus of looking at these approaches to, to achieve different kinds of justice, fossil fuel based development pathways that, that even where, where you have good technical work like finance remains a key policy question. Um, and also that, you know, the, the important role of partnerships and norms. So let me open the floor and let's have some questions, please. Can we start at the back? I think, I don't know who had their hand up first. There was, there's Pao Yu and somebody else. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So Pao Yu Ui from the Fossil Exit Research Group in Flensburg. Um, my question is to several of the panelists, as there's are remarkable plans how basically renewables are or are not part of the solution for the country. However, we speak with a lot of exporting countries' representatives over there. so. It's just one part of the metal, so to speak, if we manage to include renewables within Colombia, Nigeria, uh, South Africa, um, Indonesia, but we still keep exporting the different products. So I would be interested in your takes on and how far in the countries there is. What is the strategy if you go for a coal phase out in Indonesia in the 2040s? Is there then the plan to just export all the coal that you're not needing to other countries? Um, or in how far this is also thought, or would you say we can't talk about this now, so we first have to push coal plants out of the market, and then we have a second strategy upcoming once we're done with this to also say, well, if all of us did the same, then no one is buying the stuff anyhow, so we'll be fine. So therefore, just wanted to touch upon that issue. Thanks. Yeah, yeah Gareth Edwards from the University of East Anglia. Just, just following this question, um, obviously 80% of Indonesia's coal and 80% of Australia's coal is exported, so um, Picking up Gaylor's point, what kind of a just transition is there internationally if we focus only on domestic decarbonisation? Uh, and then a broader question actually about the... Um, I've been to a number of things recently where, in preference to just transition, the terminology of economic diversification has been preferred. And I have three questions about that that I'd like the panellists to perhaps reflect on. Firstly, where's the social in economic diversification? Secondly, where's the transition? Because at least in Australia, there's no sense of a transition. And thirdly, where's the justice? Because as soon as we start framing just transition in purely economic terms, we lose some of that urgency uh, and we you know, make it more amenable to mainstream existing status quo approaches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chloe Ferran from Climate Home News. Um, two quick questions. Uh, the first one maybe to Isabel. Um, are MDBs discussing these alternative development plans? Um, we're hearing a lot about the need for alternatives to these um, fossil fuel pathways to development. Um, you know, what is the conversation between MDBs on, on, on planning and finance package and to try and get that conversation going? And then to Elias maybe, um, just a point on this green hydrogen, hydrogen ready gas infrastructure. Um, I think there's been quite a lot of pushback from experts and analysts about the fact that some of these gas infrastructures can't actually be that easily um, converted for hydrogen use. I think maybe Michael Leibrich makes quite strong comments on, on Twitter if you follow him about this, saying it'd be, it's a kind of hilarious idea to think that these um, energy terminals can be converted to green hydrogen. So is this something that you're just saying uh, as part of the German government, or is this actually a real um, thinking behind this? Thank you. <laughs> is that on the record or off? <laughs> Uh, Kara Pike with Climate Access, a question for Radicha about, you mentioned there's two to four times the benefits of phasing out the coal-fired power plants. I'm wondering what those benefits are. Okay, I'll let you guys respond and we'll come back for a second round. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for that. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start with a question around economic diversification. I think, you know, that's that's quite clear that that's a very limited, narrow perspective. Um, it's, it, it shouldn't be, I mean, it shouldn't be forgotten, of course. I mean, that's quite critical in, in a lot of countries. I mean, certainly in South Africa, you know, coal is very concentrated in, in one particular region. I mean, it's pretty much two municipalities that are entirely reliant on, on, on coal. Um, 
So you, you have to talk about economic diversification of those particular regions to avoid ghost towns. I mean, we, we've got a particular history of ghost towns in South Africa with the phase out of gold explore, uh, exploitation for different reasons. Uh, and then we've got other potential ghost towns that could pop up, you know, uh, we're talking at, at breakfast on platinum, for instance, South Africa is also you know, a major platinum producer. It's very concentrated. For now it's booming, but who knows where it's gonna go going forward. And, and if it doesn't continue, then we'll have, we'll have potential ghost towns there as well. Um, so it's, it's part of the equation, um, but it's, it's just one small part of the equation effectively. And I think, you know, certainly in what I've presented, you know, we try to take that much broader view looking at um, you know, the, the, the diversification, but also the social, social protection aspects uh, and, and really position economic diversification just as one of the one of the pillars. So certainly, I mean, it shouldn't be reduced to that at all. Um, but it is something that helps drive investment, and I think you know I think we need to consider it uh, going going forward. Um, and then on on I think on the the kind of renewables versus versus coal. I mean, for me, it's quite interesting because I mean, in South Africa, we yeah you know, we're not really talking about coal experts at this point uh, too much, um, even though they're really important um, because they're fifty percent of. <laughs> of the coal sales in volume, but they're seventy percent in value. So you know, tend to we export the good shit, uh, and, and we keep the crap. Uh, <laughs> uh, not a not an unusual pattern. But um, uh, so I think you know that's the viability of the coal industry without export is 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 close to null. So uh, I think that's you know that's quite an important narrative. Uh, but at the moment, it's quite focused on trying to resolve our internal problems, which is A, to get electricity, uh, and B, to, to get it uh, clean and, uh, and, and, and cheap. Um, but, but linked to that, you know, in terms of building the renewable energy industry, I think that's been, that's been a big uh, debate in South Africa on, well, there has been a big debate about building the renewable energy industry overall, but now we're trying to say, well, we, we want to go big on renewable energy, but how? And I think, you know, the linkages with trying to build industrial value chain, um, that's not straightforward at all. Um, you know, we, we have been debating and struggling on trying to build actual industrial value chains around renewable energy for quite some time. Uh, that's something that we are grappling with at the moment, really at the moment, trying to get up a, a plan around building a renewable energy, um, value chain uh, but unfortunately you know um, global renewable energy companies are not very different from any other big global, global conglomerate and will do things that are only in their interest and if it's not in their interest to localize um, uh, any of the production then they won't do it so we are facing those challenges at the moment and trying to define a path forward yeah. Claudia and then Isabel yeah, very quickly on how you question. So I think um, it, it, if you read the narratives, it's really not clear uh, what's, what's the long-term perspective on exports and how it interacts with domestic developments. Um, strategically ambi ambiguous, ambiguous, I think I wrote on the slide. Um, so there is this disconnection um, that enables narratives that um, that very conveniently can put things together that are um, not compatible, right? Um, and you can see that with this idea of an energy transition leadership in Colombia that is based on both renewable, uh, rap rapid and ample uh, renewable energy production expansion domestically, but also uh, gas. Well, no, I mean, the, the situation is slightly different now with Petro, but in the previous government, yeah. Thanks. Isabel? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to start by paying tribute to Sean Bradley. I forgot before, she's uh, here today in the audience, and she was uh, one of the promoters of this MDB Just Transition Common Principles. 
So she would be able to tell you much more gossip about all the things that went uh, <laughs> behind the scenes, you know. So I'm putting her on this on the spot here, <laughs> and thank you very much to her for the very good job she did on on that dossier. There was a question specifically addressed uh, to me, which is, I think, uh, what are MDB is doing in in planning and financing packages in in different countries. Look. Um, well, MDBs have different mandates, so some of them do not do planning because they don't do policy. EIB is an example for you. You know, they finance packages, but the policy will come from someone else, so it depends. Now, uh, most of the others, we do some policy engagement and technical assistance, technical cooperation one way or the other. There is an issue with the political economy of uh, the just transition. So, for example, um, EBRD is helping some countries uh, do what we call just transition diagnostics. And uh, when we talk to them, we say, you should be announcing the transition first, and then we have a discussion on how the transition is going to happen. And they say, no, this is not how it works. Let's look at the consequences first and give me the answer on how this is going to affect my people. And when I understand the consequences and I have the plan on how to tackle them, this is when I'm going to make the announcement. So we are in a bit of a vicious cycle situation, you know, that sometimes we are asked to start financing diversification activities or um, EBRD does not do some of the uh, social packages that were being mentioned before, but, you know, we do training. This is something we can do. We do some uh, investments, uh, early closures and so on. But we have to do them without the commitment of the country that they will face out coal or whatever, it's not only about coal, it's about other things as well, uh, heavy industry. So it's a bit of a real life uh, situation here and uh, something to keep in mind. You cannot always get the country or a company to agree on something until they fully understand the consequences. And by the way, I want to see some money first. Mm -hmm. So this is one point, um, you know, maybe worth uh, highlighting here. The other I, I wanted to make is about the value chains. So there's a lot of discussion, and there was a lot of discussion here about social packages uh, for uh, affected workers and communities and this and that. Look, in reality, these companies, the, the uh, coal companies or oil and gas companies, whichever we are talking about in this just transition, they tend to be, most of them, state-owned or state-controlled and uh, powerful and large companies. So they have good social, economic or financial packages for their workers. The most vulnerable uh, part of the value chain is not with these companies, it's with the value chain, you know, the suppliers, the clients, especially the suppliers and the sub-suppliers and the third uh, time suppliers, some of which, by the way, are not in the region where we are uh, making the intervention. So it becomes a bit complicated. But this is another thing we're trying to um, tackle somehow, which is how to help the most vulnerable parts of the stranded assets value chain. Um, and those are normally out of any compensation package. Final thing about this uh, diversification, why is diversification uh, good? Look, diversification, I think, is a good option in life uh, generally um, <laughs> for, for many reasons. Some of these uh, countries, regions, etc., they, they are mono industries. They have a very high weight uh, on one particular sector. Promising as it may be, things change, as we all know. So it's good to have a portfolio of alternative economic activities people can uh, uh, resort to. And it may not be a one-to-one -one transfer from this worker that was in the smelting companies going to whatever other industry which is uh, coming up. But it's good to have the option, and some people may choose to have mobility anyway. This will happen in, you know, people like me coming from Spain and living in London and so many others. So creating economic opportunities is a very valid uh, narrative for just transition, even when you are not capable of um, making the direct link between the worker here who may end up there. It's a broader and more general economic, uh, economic story. And I'll leave it here. Take the really uh, unpolitical question on hydrogen first, I think. <laughs> I, I was about to ask if there was a question for me. <laughs> no, just to add what you said, most vulnerable parts of the value chain, I guess what is important to mention is also the informal economy that is heavily affected and is very difficult uh, to count in just transition processes. Hmm. 
Um, on the uh, H2Ready uh, question, it's a very uh, valid and important question. Um, if I'm correct, uh, I guess in the law uh, on LNG terminals, it says uh, not H2Ready. I guess it says um, the infrastructure needs to be uh, ready to be transferable to the use of hydrogen. Um, there are no technical uh, specifications on it, I guess. Um, and very much depends if you're like uh, going to import uh, green uh, hydrogen or derivatives. And um, we don't have very solid estimates about how much this costs at the moment. Um, and there are not many examples for um, the adjustments of those um, infrastructures. Um, and I guess you have to look at the very different parts of the infrastructure um, and have to find solutions for uh, different components um, in the end. I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I hope it gives some of the ideas. You can pin them at coffee. Radhiti, do you want to talk about, about the costs and benefits All right. uh, yeah. of the work you did? Yeah, um, so the, the, the benefit that we can gain from that we, we, we think we can gain from phasing out the coal early is on the avoided costs from the, from the coal subsidies because, well, we, I'm not saying that they, we are subsidizing the coal in power generation, but um, since uh, our electricity is being subsidized and most of the power generations come from coal, that indicate that it's indirectly subsidized the, the, the coal. So with the accelerated phase out, we then avoided that uh, uh, in long term. And the second thing that is being avoided is the health costs. And of course, we know that the communities surrounding the, uh, the coal fire plants and be, be impacted by the pollution and the emission produced by the coal fire plant, fire power plants. And there has been cases uh, where a coal fire plant that sits nearby the uh, a, 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 a pack, a community pack uh, uh, with people, and there has been reported uh, health issues. And if we can again accelerate this uh, coal phase out, especially in a in, in a pack communities, uh, and then we can avoid it, the the cost that is being incurred from you know treating these communities with all their health problems. Thanks. Second round. I think he had his hand up first last round. So that gentleman, you and Sephra. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Peter Newell from Sussex University. Um, two quick questions, but big questions. Uh, one is about how well models of just transition travel, because I wonder sometimes if we make assumptions about powerful trade unions, a strong state, and the existence of democratic space to have discussions about energy policy futures, and that combination of things uh, doesn't describe many situations or many contexts around the world, including um, you know northern contexts as well. So it's not just a southern challenge. So just any reflections there on positive models. But the second one is about squaring the procedural and the distributional, because sometimes when I'm in discussions on just transitions, people talk about they emphasise the procedural. Right, we need to bring all actors with us or losers, um, leaving no one behind. That type of dialogue. And yet, if we're talking about coal transitions in Europe, for example, we're talking about a very limited number of mines that are at all viable, and most. Of probably largely inconsistent. So what actually are we deliberating about? So sometimes, and this goes to the point about just transition and washing, I hear this from companies, they put the emphasis strongly on the procedure and bring everyone with us and having an exit plan and retraining. And, and that makes some sense in lots of contexts, but it's often used, also used as a strategy for delay, right? To slow down the process and make sure we don't make the transition at all. So I'm just wondering how we square the procedural and the distributional. We're definitely going to answer that in the next three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the girl said we must have five. The coffee's not ready. And the private sector, the private sector and banks are playing a key role here. We saw the Prudential uh, Interest in Sea work with the Asian Development Bank, with the, with the Asian Coal Retirement Program. Um, and that's going to come back. Um, at the moment, the major investment banks um, have commissioned. We, we have commissioned. The major investment banks have commissioned three northern NGOs: Rocky Mountain Institute, Climate Policy Initiative, and Climate Bonds Initiative to design a managed phase-out financing package for 
um, the world's most coal-fired power, most of which is in the Global South. How, how, do, how do Global South NGOs work with Global North NGOs in, in designing the specifics of these? And they're going to get launched at the COP, and I think it's going to be rather late if the Global South perspective isn't heard until the packages have been designed. I'm interested in your views on that, because I sit on one of the working groups for it. Mm. Oh, sorry, there was the woman behind you first. Sorry, she had her hand up. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's sorry, and then we have to stop because now the coffee is ready. <laughs> um, it, it, I'm wondering if, if you could address uh, where you're seeing or if you're seeing conversations around debt relief in order to ensure a global just transition. I've talked to so many countries that are currently looking at or pursuing new expansion of fossil fuel production just in order to feed their debt. And of course, there are some countries like Ecuador that literally have outright debt for oil agreements with China. So it seems to me until we start addressing uh, debt relief in a global just transition conversation in order to stop the expansion of fossil fuel production, then we're not going to be able to ensure a just transition in the global south. And, I, and I'm wondering, are there bilateral and multilateral conversations that you're seeing happening on this? Because it seems pretty critical. So I'm going to ask you each just to just do 40 seconds, 40 seconds per person on just on justice, <laughs> debt relief and north-south relations. Go. <laughs> yeah. 40 seconds. Uh, all right. Um, I'll do models of just transition travel. I think um, they don't travel very well, uh, particularly from global north to global south. Um, but it's really important to have some of our arching principles, uh, and then that will help you to then have your place-based model, which are very context-specific uh, from country to country. So that's one of the things we're trying to do, at least, is not to repeat the Global North uh, experience. Um, and then another 10 seconds on, as I said, you know, yes, some stakeholders are clearly using the just transition narrative as a way to block the transition or hinder it. We have it in South Africa, we've got many countries, where it's like just transition is no transition. Um, that's obviously very incompatible with the concept of just transition. It's actually the opposite. Uh, and that's something that we have to deal with uh, quite a lot. And I think by taking the Global South perspective to it, uh, we can certainly do that. Um, having Global North institution design anything for the Global South is highly problematic. So uh, I would not really condone any of that uh, at all. Um, or I'll probably have 40 seconds already, so you go for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to talk to the same one. Uh, everything that Geller said, and uh, yeah, I think we have these general frameworks that helps us uh, think a bit more systematically about who is going to be affected in which ways, who uh, is likely to benefit in which ways, and um, which type of uh, and uh, sectors need to be involved um, and then well then that's it and then we have to apply it to different circumstances uh, which often don't have the same institutional basis um, that the north has benefited from in uh, what they have started with the transition and especially i think in terms of subnational capacities in developing countries so there is this to work with but then it's very uh, context specific and even within country different regions have highly different contexts and also cultural and social organization that will um, enable social trust issues in a post-conflict or post-apartheid uh, country that uh, will completely change uh, the la donne in french the setup we work with uh -huh. mm. On the debt uh, relief and whether there is a discussion, a formal trade-off between uh, debt relief and uh, just transition, not that I am aware in uh, multilaterals, I can mainly speak about mine, so no, there are not. But I am aware of uh, the COPs, uh, you know, as part of the Conference of the Parties, um, financial packages are being discussed. So yes, it is part of the conversation, probably not only about just transition, it's uh, also about climate resilience, how are people coping uh, with climate change uh, impacts and so on. Yeah, I guess it's definitely an elephant in the room, um, debt, debt relief, and it's a very complex topic. Um, I would say the government is very much aware of it, um, but I can't give you details because it's not uh, discussed in our division. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I think I'll comment on the, the the partnership of the global and south uh, NGO. So it's interesting you mentioned RMI because we are also well. He they they partner with us with a for the financial modeling of the coal fire power plants phase out, and we. I think the, the the local NGO can contextualize the work because we know the landscape, the policy landscape, and the 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 stakeholder, the key stakeholders that we need to approach if we want to make this successful. So yeah, I think yeah, we 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 are currently on a partnership with RMI uh, to work on, on on the financing model development. Yeah. So yeah, I think. Thanks. Um, so one second, the coffee is ready. I must remind you there's coffee here, but also in the place where we had lunch. So if that's full here and you, are, you need caffeine like straight into your blood like me, you can walk across the beautiful um, garden thing. Um, and thank you so much for your great questions. And thank you to the panel. Please come and grab them for more discussions. <laughs>